I think it's a lot brighter than it was. Can we go down a little bit? Yeah, thank you. Guten Abend, alles. Wie geht es? Matt, no sleeping tonight. Guten Tag. Um, I think we're a little, I'm a little loud, so we'll get that adjusted. Um, I think I'm a little, I, am I a little loud? Or is it okay? Okay. Bruce, can you kick that down a little bit? It's, it's one of those magic ones. And everybody, please... Uh, Sign in and sign in twice so that we can fake out the uh, pastoral staff, all right? Wait, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I, I am sitting right here. Is that too low in light? Can you still see my shining? It's kind of like a restaurant. It's kind of like a restaurant. What kind of a restaurant? That's perfect. Thanks, Bruce. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Mike is here. He's my heckler, so... Usually it's Rachel. She's my heckler. So, anyway, uh, thank you all for coming. I think we've uh, we've got a few more, few more souls tonight. Um, um, I, this has been a, this has been a, a tough one to make tonight's lecture. I made three different versions of it, because it just it's, Exodus is hard to grab. Um, it, it, they're, they're, they're little vignettes of, of fun stories, right? Uh, grandpa tell us a story. Uh, there's lots of, you know, Grandpa tell us a story by the, by the fire. And, uh, but, but the problem with it for me is that it's so sloppy. Exodus is so sloppy. They needed an editor, or the editor was on vacation in Cancun or something like that during the writing of Exodus. And if you read, if you pick up your Exodus and you read it, I mean, really read it. Don't go into that thing, but read it, read the words. I think you'll find that it's, it, it's sloppy. Do you find it to be sloppy? Barbara? Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I bring that up at the end and I, I ask the, the right question about that. Anyway, so this is week two. As ever, what I present is a historical approach. And for some people, that's maddening because um, maybe you're not supposed to approach things uh, that way, but it is historical critical. We are allowed to look at the Bible and ask questions about it and pit history uh, verified history against it and asked the questions that can come up with it, all right? And again, due to this crazy weather, thank you all very much for coming. So I titled this The Tale of Two Stories, all right? The first is found in the Jewish book of Exodus, which is what we're covering, about the escape, escape of foreigners from Egypt, right? The second is an historical Egyptian account, history, about the expulsion of foreigners from Egypt. Two very, very different words, isn't it? Escape and expulsion. Opposites. Opposite ends. And here's where it gets really in interesting. Involving an Egyptian prince named Moses and involving an Egyptian prince named Achmosis. Awfully similar, aren't they? Moses. Ah, Moses. And these are two historical, one is, one is historical and the other is biblical, stating that it's historical. And that's what we're covering in here. Now, for today, we're going to continue with the biblical. We're going to go with Moses, all right? Now, understand that the Bible says what the Bible says happened. Did everybody sign in ten times, at least three I try to build those numbers up. Um, the Bible, how many here believes that the Bible is literal history? Show of hands, anybody. Literal history. Okay. What is it then? It's something that a group of people wrote down a long time ago. 
a long time ago, about 2,500 years ago, a group of people at a certain place at a certain time wrote down the what we call the Torah initially, all right? And they did it for their reasons, okay? And this book, Exodus, is the second in that series. It's the narrative second book of Jewish Torah and of Christian Old Testament scripture. Torah is the first five books. Generally, we view it as the first five books of the Jewish Tanakh. Ta, Torah, Na, Neveim, K, Ketuvim. That's what the Tanakh is. That's what this book that we call Exodus is in Hebrew, and it's Shemot. Shemot. And that doesn't mean an Exodus, yes? Yes, it is indeed written from right to left. And it's a very old, old language. And it, is, it underwent a lot of changes. But it doesn't mean exodus. It doesn't mean a mass departure. It has nothing to do with a bunch of people leaving one place for another. It means names. Names. Shemot. Names. That's what it means. There's lots of names in it. Lots and lots and lots of names, and the central name is Moses. So who is Moses? Who in the world is Moses? Well, we only know about Moses from initially this, and right up there with David, Moses is number two in the Old Testament for references to. I mean, all over the map. There's so many references to Moses. Backbone of Judaism, really. So, who does Moses think he is? Who do you suppose Moses thinks he is? Because that's critically important, isn't it? How are we supposed to grasp this whole process if we don't understand this man and understand his background? So I would ask you a question. Who is Moses? Who can tell me? Prince of Egypt. Prince of Egypt. Smart woman. Is he anything more than a prince of Egypt initially? Yeah, baby in a basket. Baby in a basket. Baby in a basket. How cognizant do you suppose he was of, of who he was when he was put in the basket? Not very. So his whole awareness is, is as Lois says, is he is, he is uh, prince of Egypt. According to the book of Exodus, the descendants of Abraham, now Egyptian slaves, have grown alarmingly, alarmingly in number. Who's Abraham? First patriarch. His son is Isaac, and his firstborn son is Ishmael, but we don't count him, right? Because there's a thing about second sons. Second sons all throughout the Old Testament. Second sons. And then the first son of, of, of Isaac was who? Esau. And by hook and by crook and by not very good things, Esau is put away. And who pops up? Yaakov. The two second sons are set aside. All right? Those are our three patriarchs. Abram, Yitzhak, Yaakov. Jacob got a second name, didn't he? What's his second name? Israel. Israel. Just happens to be the same name as the kingdom which was directly above Judah in Canaan, in Canaan. Just happens to be the same name as the kingdom, the plum, the best kingdom of the six Canaanite kingdoms. Just happens to be the same one. All right? Yaakov, Jacob, had... Twelve sons. Twelve sons. All right? And they represent the twelve tribes of, of Israel. Okay? Now, we've got a lot of language here. And they're going to be called also in, in, in Exodus, they're called the sons of Israel. That's the title of that. All right? So they've grown alarmingly in number. They've... Lois, they've bred like 
Wabbits. <laughs> Thank you very much. These slaves are building the twin cities of Pitom and Piramsis as the new capital of all Egypt under who? Pharaoh Ramses II. We know this. Ramses II moved the capital from the south to the north so he could be in better control of the entire country because the priests of Karnak and of Luxor were getting too much power. So he moved the capital to, to the north and he, he named his city P, city of Ramses. P. Tom and P. Ramses. And we're told this in Exodus. There's no historical basis for this, all, for this at all. We'll cover that in another, another week. But this is what we're told, okay? And P, of course, denotes city of. So, Exodus. Sons of Israel are in Egypt. Sons of Israel are in Egypt. Exodus 1.1. 1, 1. How about that? Right at the very beginning. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt. The sons of Israel. Who is the sons of Israel? The slaves who are in Egypt, and they're all related back to one of the sons of Jacob, who had a second name, which was Israel. Right? It's convoluted, but, Al, the Bible's kind of gobbledygook, right? Blame Hal for that. So that's who these people are. They're the descendants of the three patriarchs. That's who they are. And it is in throughout the, the beginning of, of Exodus, they're called, they're referred to these people as the sons of Israel. So our dual timeline, right? Green is historical, Egyptian. The reign of Ramses II. When was he, when was he in power? 1280 to 1213 BCE, and in 1240, he moved the capital north to P. Ramses, way north, up in the far eastern edge of the Nile Delta, way up there. Blue is biblical. Exodus 111, P. Ramses, or 11, actually, 111, P. Ramses and P. Tom. We got a little, we got a little bite. One date. Biblical and historical, right there. Exodus, population growth. They bleed like wabbits. Exodus 1.7, the sons of Israel increased greatly and multiplied, becoming exceedingly mighty so that Egypt was filled with them. Filled with them. That's no small thing. That's what the Bible says. That's what Exodus says about it. And there we get the whole thing with fancy graphics. All right, but where? Where are they? If they're building P. Ramses, where are they? Where they're working? They're way, way up in, in the Nile Delta on the eastern side. Concern over the wapid increase in the slave population requires serious attention. Exodus 1, 15 through 22, Pharaoh said to the Hebrew midwives, when a son is born, you shall put him to death. If it is a daughter, then she shall live. Now, for those of you who know livestock, that's absolutely backwards, isn't it? How many bulls do you need if you have, if you have, if you have 30 cows? How many bulls do you need? One. If you're concerned about having too many calves... What do you go after? The cows, right? How about, how about lions? How many lions do you need in, a, in a, uh, a pride of lions with 20 lionesses? You need one. So it's all backwards here. So he's saying, let's kill all the little boys, but let the daughters live so that they can grow and weed like wabbits. Okay, so... That's what, that's what it says. So does that sound familiar, this issue of killing baby boys? Sound familiar? Does that ring a bell in your New Testaments? The slaughter of the innocents, the massacre of the innocents, right? This, this is the original. Source for the same in Matthew 2, 16 through 18. Who orders that little baby boys around Bethlehem of a certain age and under be killed? Herod. Herod, right? 
Herod had all the boys killed in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two or under. And Matthew dug back into the Old Testament and he found this and it was perfect. All right? To save her son, a Jewish mother set him in a basket and sent him out along the Nile. Does that sound safe to you? It doesn't, but it's a good story. It's a good story, right? So she's got this little boy, it's a beautiful picture, and she sends him out on the Nile, and he gets caught up in the bulrushes, right? Right? So let's go to our movie. <laughs> Pharaoh's daughter, a princess of Egypt, discovered the baby among the reeds. And she opens it up, and she says, i got to keep this one. I want this one. The child was adopted by the royal family who raised him as their own, a baby. Do you think he had any uh, awareness of life before? He is, he is raised in the royal family, in the, in the palace itself, and they named him Moses, a very Egyptian name. It's an extremely Egyptian name, and it's not, it is not a Jewish name. Moses, prince of Egypt. Thank you, Lois. The writers of Exodus managed to get the baby's real mother into the royal palace as wet nurse to the infant. That, it's a good story. All without knowing that she was the child's real mother. But after he's weaned, which didn't take long, uh, maybe that's where the little, the little red blanket and this raising in the ways, but that's in the movie. That's in the movie. And then we never hear from her again, okay? She's, she's out of the picture, but... That's, the story is that, it's created. Moses was raised in the royal palace as a, as a member of Pharaoh's family, right? Right. He knew only Egyptian traditions, including Egyptian religion, right? Right. Moses knew nothing else. Moses was an Egyptian prince in the Pharaoh's household. Moses was that. That's all he knew. That's who Moses thought he was. That's exactly who Moses thought he was. Exodus 2, 15. Look at this. This is so subtle. Only not. When Moses was grown, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. Looking about and seeing there was no one around, he struck and killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. Right? But here's what the writers slip in. When Moses was grown, he went out to his fellow Hebrews. What does that tell you? What do you, what do you suddenly have going on in your mind? That he knows. That he knows. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. One of his fellow Hebrews reiterates it. Looking about and seeing there was no one around, he struck and killed the Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. It's very subtle. Suddenly, we are, our minds are being turned turned away from that. Oi! So suddenly he's Jewish. Oi! I like these two are laughing over here. You got that. Oi! Suddenly he's Jewish. And that's, that's what the writers intend. Okay? Hyperbole. Careful yet abrupt insinuation. Changing the language ever so little to create a different outcome. A different mindset so introduces something into our minds, takes us another way. So from Egyptian royalty, right? And in an instant, Hebrew. Bingo. Exodus 2.15, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. Now, why would he do that? As a prince of Egypt, do you suppose it would be too bad of a thing that he saw a, 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 an Egyptian overseer beating a slave and he killed him? Not at all. But in this, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. Oi! Really? Seriously? This is quickly shifting. And so Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Okay? I can't tell you where the well is, but I can tell you where Midian is. And just like that, Moses is out of the family, a death sentence on his head, and 300 miles away in Midian, sitting beside a well. That's how fast this story changes. So where in the world is Midian? Well, we saw it last night. Why Midian? Why, 
Why are we going to do that? What is it? What's it about this little tiny kingdom? Well, there's our mess, right? Mediterranean is up in the top. Uh, that's not the Red Sea. That's the Gulf of Suez, way north of the Red Sea in the Gulf of Aqaba. That's the Dead Sea over on the side there. You can see how close all of this stuff is. This is our Nile Delta, okay? This is Piramsis. And Moses is going to go all the way down here to Midian, way over just east of the Gulf of Aqaba. And in Midian, right around Midian, is Mount Horeb, or Mount Hor, or Sinai, but it's always called the Mount of God. It's always called the Mountain of God. Now, there's other Mount Sinai's down in the Sinai Peninsula, and people argue about whether that's there, and that's why this, this trip and all that stuff, but... It's here. It's here because more often than not, the Mount of God is referred to as Horeb, not Sinai, if you read your Bible. <clears throat> to get to Midian from Piramsis, Moses escapes Egypt eastwards via the marshy land between the Gulf of Suez and the Mediterranean Sea. We talked about that last, last week. In Hebrew, this marshy area is called the Yam Suf, and it's mentioned many times in Torah. It is the Sea of Reeds, Yam Suf in Hebrew. It is not Erutra Tarase in Greek. Every single time in your Bibles, it says the Red Sea, you'll find a little letter beside it. If you'll take the time to look down at the bottom, it'll say original Hebrew, Reed Sea or Sea of Reeds. It's a translational error to call it the Red Sea in every single one of your versions. I promise you. It's nowhere near the Red Sea. It's so far north. The Yamsuf, that's the Med in the north. And down there is the Gulf of Suez. All right? That's where, our, that's where the, uh, the Suez Canal is in because it's a mess, right? 100-mile passage between the tip of the Gulf of Suez and, and the Mediterranean Sea. It's precisely where the Suez Canal was built in 1869 because of its placement. There's a lot of water in there. You don't have to dig so much. There's a lot of water. It is comprised mostly of low marshy reedlands and both salt and fresh water lakes, large and small, all the way down, all the way down. Pathways existed through it, but roads did not because it was so marshy, okay? It was a natural barrier for keeping people out. It was hard to get through there. And there were lots of, of Egyptian garrisons on the other side of that. That's the Yamsuf. The capital city of Piramsis was to the far northeast of the Nile Delta, really close to the Yamsuf, very close to the Yamsuf. Either direction, passage through the Yamsuf was mostly single file. The Yamsuf is the Sea of Reeds, the Reed Sea. It's not the Red Sea. That's a translational area, error. Moses crosses the Yam Suf. He has to go through that. He continues on to Midian. And he's in Midian, and he's going to be there for 60 years. He's on, the, he's on the hoof, right? He's on the lamb. He's running. Okay? That's the first 20 years of his life. So why Midian? When researching, I find constant question coming to the forefront, always. What does this accomplish? Why Midian? Midian accomplishes a lot of things, okay? The mountain of God, right? Hor, Horeb, or Sinai. It's all the mountain of God, all of them. You've got to have the place where God dwells. You have to have the place where God dwells, and it just happens there is where the Mount of God is. Who seems to dwell there? Who's there? The God of Genesis dwells there. I am Yahweh or even Yahu. Yahu. Pretty close to Yahweh. Yahu. Historical note, the God worshipped in Midian was a moon or mountain God named Yahu in Midian. Just north of it in Edom, they also worshipped the god Yahu, and further, further west, the god of, where was that, Bruce, further west? Oh, think on it, and, and then shout it out. 
In the Ugaritic texts, which are the Hittite texts, these, these baked clay tablets, Yahu is listed as a minor god within the Elohist pantheon. What was the pantheon of gods that all of Canaan, all of Canaan worshipped, all six kingdoms? The El pantheon. El, Asherah, Baal, and then the other 71 sons. This was what was worshipped in Canaan. And it says, you, we're not going to have Yahweh appear until sometime in the 8th century BCE. It takes that long, historically. Historically. He is a minor son of El or Asherah. Yahu is listed in the Ugaritic te text as a minor god in the El pantheon. He's a moon or mountain god. Jews are prohibited from speaking the name of G-D. Yahweh is used. It's used as a substitute. Yet this name, Yahu, is found everywhere in Hebrew names. Everywhere. Open up your Bibles. Look in your Old Testaments. Hezekiah is Hezekiahu, meaning mighty of. Isaiah is Ishayahu, salvation of. Jeremiah is Yermiyahu, exalted of. And even today, Netan Yahu. Sound familiar? Gift of, mighty of, salvation of, exalted of, gift of, Yahoo. It's still there. Yahoo. Yahoo. We're not supposed to say the name, but it say the name, but it's everywhere throughout all of the naming of the Old Testament. It's everywhere. Hezekiahu, Yermiahu. It's everywhere. Yahoo, it's right in your face. It's right there. And Yahoo became Yahweh through these writers. But it didn't disappear. And it's kind of messy that way. All of this is kind of messy that way, historically. In Midian, Moses is taken in by a man named Reuel, El Pantheon, Reuel, or Jethro, or Hobab. I mean, he's, he's got a lot of names, okay? Like a lot of this, there's lots of names, okay? Who offers Moses his daughter Zipporah in marriage, okay? Moses goes to Midian, and he sits down by a well, and he has a little encounter, and he protects these women, and he's given one of them, Zipporah, uh, as a bride, and he's now in the family. He's in the family. And he's going to be there for 60 years, and he's going to do quite well. All right? Moses stays in Midian for lots of, lots of time. And, and finally, by the age of 80, okay? He's got a lot longer to live. He's establishing himself, okay? And he's all this time, 60 years, he's in Midian, okay? One day, Moses climbs the Mount of God, searching for a lost goat or sheep. Is this sounding familiar? It's important to understand that in no way is Moses aware of his lineage as a descendant of Abraham, Yitzhak, or Yaakov, the three patriarchs. He has no idea who he is. He thinks he's a runaway Egyptian prince. Okay, that's all he knows. Moses knows only that he's a runaway prince of the royal house of Egypt. Only the local worship of a god named Yahu has added to his religious understanding. He, this, is, this is who he is. At this moment in time, let's be clear, the people in slavery back in Piramsis, the sons of Israel, or even the Hebrews, if you want to use that word, are not yet anything even close to being what we would recognize as being Jews, right? They have no laws yet. They've got no organization, no traditions that set them apart. They are related to the 12 sons of Jacob, also known as Israel, and that's it. They're not Jews yet. We try to turn them into the, our, our, a version of Judaism, but they haven't got anything. They haven't gotten even the first 10 mitzvot, the first 10 laws of the Ten Commandments. They have nothing. God hasn't spoken to them since God said to Abraham, stop, don't kill him. There's no communication since then. These people only know they're related to these 12. 
They've been in Egypt for 430 years, it says so, mostly as free people. They have been more recently been enslaved by a pharaoh who did not know their connection to Joseph centuries past. That's what's changed for them. They evidently have no formal worship of the silent deity that interacted with Abraham 500 plus years before. They're merely related. There's nothing else there. Do you understand? There's nothing else there. How do we know that? Because it all happens afterwards in Exodus. They're not going to synagogue. There's no temple. They have no laws. They have no kosher. They have nothing yet. That's who these people are. While Moses is on the Mount of God, a voice seems to emit from a burning bush. This is the first time since Abraham that God has spoken to any of, of, of these descendants. First time. This God states that he has become aware of the harsh treatment of his people. His people, 500 years later, of his people in Egypt and that Moses is to return and free them. Sounds blunt, sounds hard. This is what it says. This is all brand new. Moses protests that he's unworthy of such a task. He evidently stutters. He seems to immediately accept that he's included among the people in question. Suddenly, he is, he's in this group. Moses says that his inability to speak in public makes him ill-suited to the task. And this God, I am, insists and gives Moses supernatural gifts to aid him. Specifically, a stick that can do things. All right? That's what it says. I am tells Moses that his older brother, he has an older brother, I have an older brother. Suddenly he's got an older brother. His older brother's name is Aaron. He says, I am tells him that his older brother's on his way to Midian to meet him, to meet Moses, to hear the plan to free the descendants of Abraham in Egypt and to help Moses in this task. Wow, is this moving fast, right? And, and, you've got an older brother, and he's on his way now, okay? That's a convoluted mess, really. Since when did Moses even have an older brother? Well, how does Moses know that, that Aaron is his brother? Where is Aaron from? What's, there's so much news. It's so fast moving in here. Moses seems to be immediately convinced and sets off with Zipporah and their two sons to return to Egypt. He's on board. He is on board. All right? Lots of questions arise in all of this. We later find out that Moses is, that's when we find out that he's 80 years old at the time. <laughs> sure, I'll go. Just, who's Aaron? How old is Zipporah? How old are their sons? Do they have grandchildren? Well, if he's 80, I would imagine his sons are probably in their 60s. He's probably got a whole slew. He's got his own, his own group, right? A number of years ago, I sang, I sang a, a concert opera called Moses und Aaron. And uh, the role of Moses was a spoken role with Dietrich fischer dieskau doing that. And I sang the role of Aaron. And it was all atonal stuff. And it was a wild ride because... I sang it in Los Angeles, and I sang it on a tour all around Germany. That was years ago. And, uh, but being the mouthpiece as Aaron, and doing, because it was all biblical stuff, and singing all this atonal music, and oh, it was a wild, wild opera. It took me a long time to learn it, too. <laughs> so Moses plans to return to Egypt, right? He's been there 60 years. And he's going to go backwards, right? Through it, he's going to go back from Midian through the wilderness of Shur, across the Yam Suf, and go back into the delta. He's going to Piramsi. He said he's going to talk to he's going to talk to who the new pharaoh is. Remember, it's been 60 years, it's gone by. All right, the old pharaoh's long dead. So this is his plan. He's going to do this. Exodus 4, 21 through 31 is so messy. The Lord said to Moses, go back to Egypt. Say to Pharaoh, the Lord says, Israel is my son. This is God's son, my son, my firstborn. 
Behold, I'm going to kill your son, your firstborn. This is what God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh when he, when he gets there. <laughs> Hi. Oh, and by the way, it's been a long time. And by the way, uh, my God's going to kill your son. Okay. Brings up a lot of questions. Moses and his family dutifully leave Midian. They're, they're, they're off. They're committed. Along the way, God tries to kill Moses. Didn't see that one coming, did you? But Zipporah rescues Moses by taking a flint knife, cutting off the foreskin of their son, and throwing it at Moses' feet. Well, it comes out of nowhere. It's just right there. Did that shock anybody? Look it up. It wasn't in the movie. Cecil B. DeMille. It was, they left that on the cutting room floor. Yeah. Something of, you're with us. You're with us. Oh, that's I didn't know. I see, I didn't know this. Nobody asked. How many people knew this? Row of hands. How many people knew this? One? Pastor, did you know this? Is that shock you? It doesn't shock you. We're, we're reading Exodus. It doesn't shock you at all. Right. <laughs> Exodus 4, 24. Can you imagine? Out of the blue. And God tries to kill Moses. Kind of like Pharaoh tried to. So what? What in the world is that? How, how do we do that? Well, gobbledygook, right, Hal? The Lord said, no. Then it jumps in. Yes, Mike. How, how did the, 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 the flint knife and its activity and, and throwing on Moses' feet stop God? Evidently, it's just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> Evidently, it was just the right turn of the, turn of the flint knife, you know? It, it, but why would somebody come up with that? What writer would say, hey, we got to keep this in? This is a good one. And then we jump out here, and it says, out of the blue, it says, the Lord said to Aaron, suddenly God's, talk, God's talking to Aaron. Now, Aaron's got to be back in Piramsis, right? So, uh, uh, can you th imagine being Aaron? Aaron's saying, who's that? Who's there? The Lord said to Aaron, go meet Moses in the wilderness. And Aaron says, I didn't even know he left. It's been 60 years. I thought he was still in the palace. So Aaron leaves, and he went and he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Well, wait a minute. I thought, I thought Moses and Zipporah and everybody was on the way in the wilderness, and now, now we gotta, we got we to gotta come here. You know, this is, it, it's messy. It's messy. It's sloppy. It is. So, so after God tried to kill him, Moses, is he still going? Did he say, I'm not going there now? And Aaron meets Moses on the Mount of God. So Moses had to return. He had to leave the wilderness for her, and he had to go back into Midian, and he had to go back up on the Mount of God to meet Aaron? Evidently, because that's what it says happens, okay? Mount of God, burning bush, depart for Egypt, right? Then God tries to kill you, right? And Aaron, in a, somewhere, Aaron's coming back on this direction. And Moses goes, he's got to go back, right? Moses and Aaron kiss on the mountain. Uh, and then they all set out again for Egypt. This is wild. And they didn't even have text or email. Think about that. 40 days, it would take Aaron 40 days to get there, and how in the world is this, and, and if Aaron's his older brother, he's gotta be like 82, right? <laughs> Think about that. So meanwhile, as my father would say, meanwhile, back at the ranch, meanwhile, back in Egypt, Exodus 4, Aaron spoke the words, now they're all back in Piramses. Bingo, like that. Aaron spoke the words of the Lord to the elders of the sons of Israel, while Moses performed signs in the sight of them. 
Now picture that. Aaron's talking and Moses is making snakes, you know. And then when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their affliction, they bowed low and worshipped. Bingo. Silence for 500 years. And you have Aaron saying this and that and Moses is performing stuff with a, with a stick and they bowed low and worshipped. Suddenly they've got their own God. I mean, this happens so quickly in here. It, the setup is amazing. Moses confronts the current Pharaoh. Okay, well, based upon these numbers, if in 1180 BCE, we'll have a timeline shortly, the Pharaoh would have been named, would have been Ramses III. Okay, that's going to skip a few because remember, Ramses had, Ramses II had 100 sons. His successor was Merneptah, and he was the 13th son. Twelve previous sons had died already by the time Ramses II died in 1213. Merneptah just happened to be still alive, but he's a pretty old guy too, right? So Ramses III, he was only pharaoh for two years because the world came apart. The world came apart. And he fought, off, he fought off the invading sea peoples. Who are the sea peoples? Guess who they're going to be? Eventually, they're going to be the Philistines and the Phoenician states, all on the rim of the Mediterranean. That's who they're going to become. But they're not even yet. They're not yet. So Moses confronts the current pharaoh, demanding that the descendants of Abraham in Egypt be freed from bondage, bondage and free to leave. Now, grappling with the absolute collapse of the entire region due to, to, uh, due to earthquakes and volcanic tectonic activities, the fall of the Mycenaean Empire, the Hittite Empire, the Minoan Empire, the collapse of everything in the whole region, the invasion of the Sea Peoples all at the same time, the end of the 19th Dynasty and the end of the New Kingdom, the contraction of Egypt way back out, uh, way far south again because it's so bad in the whole region. Pharaoh was kind of busy, okay? Date-wise, this is exactly at the same time. When does the whole area, region collapse? 1177, we're talking 1180. This is the whole enchilada right now. So can you imagine if, if Moses said, hey, the Pharaoh would say, not now, I'm busy. Moses says, hey, I mean, this is going to be hard to do. And besides, if you're going to have 10 plagues, boy, this destruction in the area, that's a good accounting for it, isn't it? The world was falling apart at the time. Call it plagues. Call it what you want to. It just happens to line up that a lot of bad stuff was happening at the time. A lot. So Pharaoh denies Moses' demands, according to the book of, of Exodus. Pharaoh says, no thanks. But we're told time and time again that God says, I'll harden his heart so he'll say no. That's hardly fair, is it? God sets him up. Makes it so he can't say, sure, you guys can leave if you want to. Exodus describes numerous conflicts between Pharaoh and Moses toward the final exit of the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the sons of Israel, before they can leave. Big conflicts, bad things, turning the Nile into blood, frogs, lice or gnats, flies, pestilence of livestock, plague of boils, storms of hail and fire, locusts and darkness, and that's not even the worst of it. Oh. Yeah, you, you, she took my thunder. Amy took all my thunder, bad. The cartoon version. You're taking even more of my thunder now. Gosh. If you want to come up and teach this. Oh, I tell you, I'm wagging my finger at you, Amy. Exodus 4.21. I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let my people go. Oh, whoop, I got to go back one. Can I do this? Sometimes I do this. And it's not there. Let's see what I got. Am I sort of there? 
I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let my people go. Why would he do that? Why would that happen? Then you will say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. I told you, let all Israel go so they may worship me. But you refuse to let them go. Now I will kill all your firstborn sons. Okay, and so those, we've already done those nine, and the last one is the death of the firstborn. The death of the firstborn. And Exodus states clearly that after the final plague of God upon Egypt where Pharaoh lost his own son, uh, it's pretty bad. Pharaoh called for Moses and said, get out from among my people, take your flocks and herds and go. Get out. Finally, God will allow him God doesn't make him say no. God says that he can, it's time to go. After all of this, after all of this, with a brief time of packing up, including a tremendous amount of gold and valuables. Gold and valuables? Did you, did you know that? Pastor, did you know that? Massive amounts, massive amounts. Slaves with great wealth? Whoa, no problem. This is the Bible. Exodus 12, the Israelites asked the Egyptians for silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards them, and they gave them whatever they asked for. And here's what ends. So they plundered the Egyptians. That's what it says. And now they leave with all this gold and silver and Clothing, evidently. I'm sure it's pretty nice stuff. They're laden down with this, and this, this is all the plan. According to the tribal lists of 750,000 able fighting age men of the sons of Israel, the minimum sons of Israel, you got to double that if they each have wives, right? All right? So we're at a million five already. We haven't gotten into old people or children yet, or multiple wives, so a more realistic number is two plus million people. And that's, that's, a, that's a pretty easy number compared to where it starts. This is what it says, okay? That's how many able fighting age men are of these, these people getting ready to leave, and all of them set out to depart from Egypt. They're all up there, right? They're all up there. In the, uh, in the Nile Delta, right next to the Yam Suf. They're all there. That's a lot of people up there. That's, what the, that's at least what, the, what it says. Now, remember that the Bible conflates numbers like incredibly, okay? So, but still, even if it's a tenth of that, it's a lot of people. Moses was grown when he fled to Midian. That's going to be about 20 years, okay? So... Moses was 80 when he led them out of Egypt. Therefore, he was in Midian for 60 years. The Israelites wandered in Shur for 40 years after that, going round and round and round. Exodus tells us that Moses died on Mount Nebo at age 120 before he got in, okay? He never got to see it, all right? Here's our timeline, biblical, historical. 1280, Ramses is crowned. 1240, the establishment of Piramsis, okay? And there is our marker, right? It anchors everything. It anchors everything. That, according to, Gen to Exodus, that anchor is right there. The sons of Israel build Piramsis, 1240. Therefore, if, if it's 20 years, if tw he's 20 years old, when all of this starts again, he was born in 1260. This, is a, this isn't absolute, it's just based upon the numbers we're given, okay? Adult life in Midian, he's going to be there for 60 years, right? He's going to be 80 in 1180, okay? And 1177 is regional collapse right there. It's interesting how it's right there. It's right there, historical. It's right there. If, if, these, if these dates are what we're given... It's rather fascinating that the absolute collapse of the entire region happens to be right about then. Burning Bush, return to P. Ramses, again, it's right at that point at 1180 when he's done. 
in Midian, Exodus, going round and round for 40 years in Shur before they get to go in, and finally Moses' death around age 120. That's going to be around 1140. That's based upon the, the dates and the numbers that were given in Exodus. That's just how it kind of lines up against the historical, okay? For those of you who like timelines. Exodus 1240. The time that the sons of Israel had lived in Egypt was 430 years. It says, that's what it says there. At the end of 430 years, to the day, all the multitudes of the Lord departed from the land of Egypt. To the day. Another timeline time. Eleven eighty, go backwards, go backwards. Four hundred and thirty years, right? We're going to go backwards. And we're going to land right about here. Seventeen ten BCE. That's a very interesting date. We'll find out in the next couple of weeks why that's. I just want you to see that date based upon this 430 years. That date's very important. That date is really important in Egyptian history. Very important, that date. What am I doing here? So Moses, the chosen hero of God, right? Finally leads his people, all 1.5 to 2 million of them, out of Egypt from Piramsis to the same place he himself had traveled many years before, to Midian and the Mount of God. The exit must have been like a herd of turtles. <laughs> How are you going to move that many people through some kind of barrier and go 300 miles? Okay? In this case, through a swamp. they got to go through a swamp. Well, how... how, how do you think they're going as a as a, a hundred person wide line? I don't think so. So Moses parting the Red Sea would look like this. That's from the movie, right? But in reality, in reality, it looks more like this. Look at that. Okay? Moses parting the Reed Sea. They gotta get through that to get out of there. And they can't go much more than single file through there. There are pathways through this. There are pathways through this. And then they've got to go through the wilderness of Shur, and they've got to get into Midian. It's going to take a long time. It's going to take 40 days at the minimum for the first person to leave to arrive in Midian. And 40 days in that time, then the last person would just be leaving if it was like single file all the way through. Okay? That's a long haul. So you add those two together, and it's 80 days to get there with no breaks, no rest stops, nothing. So gained over centuries of over the, uh, the fire, Grandpa, tell us a story. Tell us a story, right? These are stories, marvelous stories, messy stories sometimes. And never underestimate the power of oral tradition over time, okay? Because a lot of these are collections of, of oral traditions. But I'll tell you that from the date that these things were written, going back in time, if it was at this time, it's 750 years. What do you remember from 750 years ago? Give me a date. Give me something. Give me something. I'll give, you, I'll give you right in there, Hastings, 1166, 1066, Battle of Hastings. I wasn't there. I've read about it. Norman Conquest. Give me another date. Tell me all you know about it. Tell me what it looked like. Agincourt, a little bit later. But this, these people were writing about something that they were describing as having occurred 750 years before. That's fascinating, isn't it? It's not 
as old as it says it is. We know when it was written and where and by whom. Hist history, academia knows. We know when it was written. It's, this is the challenge of historical critical. So where did Moses lead them? All of these people? Right back to where he had gone before. He went, he, he just backtracked. He did three legs of this. Right back to Midian and the Mount of God. Where are the Ten Commandments from? Mount of God. He's doing the same thing. There's lots of problems with what we've covered tonight. There's lots of challenges. It's not perfect. It doesn't claim to be, I don't think. Actually, this is, is quite sloppy writing. There's lots to clean up, and yet it's, they're, little, they're little stories inside of stories. How about God trying to kill Moses out of the blue? Boy, Grandpa, tell us a story. That's a good one, isn't it? And can we even say, can we even say that it's sloppy writing? Are we allowed to say that about anything in our Bibles? I think we are. I think we can. You just, you ever wonder just who wrote it? Just when they wrote it, right? Where they wrote it? And more importantly, you ever wonder just why they wrote it? Why would anybody write this stuff? Why would they do that? It's a great question. Deserves some thought, I think. Thank you all for coming. This is, you look a little bit shell-shocked out there. Are you shell-shocked? Why are you shell-shocked? Can you put, hmm? Me? When I was in elementary school. Yeah. Yeah. I was the smallest kid in the class. Yeah. And she was in down and she uh, just didn't look at me. Yeah. And I turned to the person next to me, passed it on. Well, by the time I got to eighth, there, was, there wasn't any relationship between what she had told me and what the last kid was yeah. saying. Yeah. No relationship whatsoever. And 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 but that is not that is not a there is extraordinary oral traditions that are really quite, quite, quite amazing. These are people who are, their practically their entire life is to be a repository of, of, of oral stories, of oral traditions, and they're they are, are amazing, but they really, really work at it. Okay, but what hap Who is the one that made up the story first? Your teacher had to think of something to tell you. So what was her process by, come, by which she came up to tell you something? You see? So when somebody writes it down, which is what makes it different from oral, and suddenly it's written, and now it's fixed, and yeah, yeah, things are fiddled with over time. We know that, right? But for the most part, it, it is, it, once it's written, it remains the same. But let's think about this next week. I want you to think about why? Why this story? What does it accomplish? You've got all kinds of supernatural stuff and things about it, but strip that away and ask the question, what does this story accomplish? It's got to accomplish something. Does it? Does it need to accomplish something? Hal, who is it? Who is it? <clears throat> That's all right. You ought to be in the middle of a, of a classical concert when the orchestra, when the conductor goes like this in a ready and some lady's phone goes off. Oh. The conductor turned around and looked and she's over there doing this. He points the baton at her and he says, he was in, in Italy and he says, respondi. He's meaning answer it. You know. And they started shouting, 40, 40 la donna, throw her out, throw her out. <laughs> no, no. You know, I did it. I sang professionally for, oh, gosh, forever. And I, it's what I did. 
You know, it's kind of like asking a dentist. Do you sing at home? No. Once in a while, Rachel will get me to sing. But uh, it is, uh, it's what I did. It's, it, it's, uh, I, and a lot of stuff comes back to me of the pressures and the, you know, going out and singing in front of 5,000 people is no small thing. Yeah, but what? But you liked it. I liked lots about it, yeah. and I was good at it. But I have to say, I don't miss it. Yeah. I did it enough. Yeah. I don't need to do it anymore. <laughs> but to ask yourself the question about about these things, why are they here? So, you're you're look a little shell shocked. Why? Why are you shell shocked? You don't have to answer that. Answer it. Think about it. Yes. Yes, hit it, Al. Give me your question. So you went through all of this stuff and a lot of it's lots of prayers and lots of passion and lots of tears. Yeah. So I'll get back to just the history. Yeah. And there's something in the history of history which corresponds to some of the Bible stories. So what there is some. There is some. They were thorough. They were quite thorough. Yeah. So, and they disappear in history. I mean, there are too many people reading Egypt and, um, <laughs> and you know, all hell is breaking loose. Well, we we will we will absolutely cover that, oh. completely. Okay. That's the tale of two stories. Is there is there is a huge number of Canaanites who end up in the Nile Delta historically but they're not these people but they're Canaanites they're up in the Nile Delta they built their capital cities their twin cities right there right there Pitom and Piramsis were built right on top of Tanis and Avaris their capital cities it's just 300 years earlier and so they're there and it was referred to by the Egyptians as the great shame that they, were, that they had been there at all. And that's what we'll eventually get to as our tale of two stories. Yes, Bruce. You can't conquer a kingdom, typically, unless you're outside of it, can't you? Right? There's, you can have uprisings from within, but really, conquest is from, from without, isn't it? Conquest is, is accomplished from without. So you got to be out to be able to get back in. And that's a big part of this. That's a teaser for now. It's a teaser. Thank you all for coming. I really do appreciate it. Please, please keep coming back. Um, I hope you weren't too shell shocked, such that it doesn't, it's not interesting for you. And uh, and uh, take care and be safe out there. It's still pretty, pretty wild weather. I thank you all. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.